welcome to this session in conversation with Stephen Oliver. My name's Sally Bothroyd and I'm the director of WordStorm this year. And I'll just say that it was a bit hard to, to contact Stephen Oliver. I was trying all sorts of ways, sending emails around here, there and everywhere, even using famous friends that I vaguely knew from school and things like that. And then one day someone just rang the, at the office and said, oh, hello, Stephen. And um, <laughs> I was thinking, oh, is this, is this a tradesman that I've got a quote off or who's this? And then I was, suddenly I realised it was Stephen Oliver. It was the sexy voice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he'd come to Darwin. So that was really great. Okay. Woo! Um. <laughs> well, just to tell you a bit about him, Stephen Oliver is a descendant of the Kukuyalanji, Wanyi, Gangalida, Wapabara, Banjalung and Biripai peoples. Biggest mob. Biggest mob. <laughs> he studied at the Aboriginal Music Theatre Training Program and then at WAPA. Stephen is the former Assistant Artistic Director at Aboriginal Centre for the Performing Arts and has worked with Yira Yakin, Kumbajara Theatre, Labois Theatre, Jude Theatre, Kite Theatre and the Queensland Arts Council. He's also known for his spoken word work with millions of views online and is a published poet and playwright. Stephen is a creative force behind ABC's hit comedy sketch show, Black Comedy. Slack comedy act. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, today uh, he's going to be talking to the lovely Marianne Butler, who may need no introduction. She was actually the first director of WordStorm. There were NT Writers Festivals up here, but she's the one that came up with the idea of WordStorm and it has stuck. <laughs> so thank you, Marianne. Um, of course, Mary Ann's a prize-winning playwright and I've lost her bio here. I've got to turn the page and I that'll can't. So I'll say do. broken, highway, lost hearts and, and many, many more. So I'll hand over to Mary Ann. Thank you, Sally. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Lovely to see you. Um, as always, it's a huge honour to be on Larrakia land and um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, past, present and future. Um, so you've heard Stephen's official biography um, and I've had the dreadful job all this week, as you can imagine, of uh, having to watch him on YouTube. For sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Research, clearly. Um, and I think I got the best gig of the festival. Um, and once I sort of, you know, did the whole back catalogue of black comedy, um, I just discovered all these other things about him which uh, I didn't know and um, I'm hoping that's, that he will speak to some of them today. Um, he is an actor, a dancer, a writer, a spoken word artist. He's an ambassador for Are You OK Day. He's formidably intelligent, um, sensitive, astute. He's highly political. He's piss funny. He's philosophical. He's considered and he has the heart of a lion. He's also a self <laughs> He's also a self-appointed slut. <laughs> that alone. <laughs> he's very sexy and he's single, so his name's going to flash up on the screen. And I am single. So yeah. <laughs> um, and the thing that I've just, uh, I was down in um, Sydney in March at the National Play Festival and the standout play in the entire festival was written by Stephen Oliver. Oh, it kind it of was phenomenal. Yeah. So not only does he do TV, but um, and the thing about this play, it had uh, three different layers that were, that were really beautifully woven. It was called From Darkness Whence We Came and it was based on his family mm -hmm. and it knitted together these incredible kind of very black humour threads, literally, um, and sort of this beautiful pathos and this kind of otherworldly thing. So I was going to ask Stephen to talk about talk to that or talk to playwriting um, and where that story came from as well? Um, yeah, well, that story, uh, it came about for a couple of things because um, I, I wanted to take the term darkness and put it in a positive spin because I, I think like when people talk about, you know, the dark or black, it's always a negative kind of way. It's like blacklist, black market, black mail, black, mm -hmm. you know, the really funny thing. I started writing a poem and um, I was trying to put the shoe on the other foot, which I do a lot of my work. So I started writing like, you know, how would it if you constantly heard it white in a negative way? So it was always like white male, white market, white. And then I was like, I better look up if these are actual words. <laughs> and sure enough, they were like white market is when everything's legal. Um, white list is when you're in good credit and all that kind of stuff. So it was interesting. So yeah, that's the title I wanted like from darkness. Because, you know, I think darkness, is, you know, it's a beautiful thing with you know, without the dark, you wouldn't see the stars. You know, the dark stars, the stars are brightest when it's darkest. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to put that kind of in a positive 
way, but I also wanted to do it about, you know, because with our mob and like with Blackfellas, like when we sit around and we talk about spirits and stuff like that, because that's the kind of premise of the play is that they're a family, they get visited by spirits, um, but they stop visiting the rest of the family and just start focusing on the 17-year-old boy and that family don't really know, you know, what's kind of going on with that. Um, but then, oh, I don't know if I'm kind of giving the plot away, but... So what about... Synopsis what, here, if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Is it a big real? Well, they, they, well, kind of what it is. And then when they come to the boy, because in, they, they, they think that what the spirits are doing is when they come to them, that they're kind of tormenting them because in their dreams, you know, the family, they're like being dragged around the room and all this kind of stuff. But what they actually find out is that with the boy, the reason why they started focusing on them is because they weren't tormenting them. Mm. They were trying to wake them up because this existence that we're in now is still the dreaming. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so and then when they go into the dreams in this other place, then that's when they were taking to this you know, to another level of existence. Um, and, yeah, and so it was basically, you know, the family is, uh, it's all about the family because there's been a tragedy with the family and they're becoming disconnected. But, you know, what I really want to show is that this family is representative of the world. And, you know, it's the world. We're, we're living in a world where we're becoming so disconnected and it's like, you know, the threads of, of humanity are fraying. So how does a world stay connected then you know what I mean and I think and as you know like you said as an ambassador for are you okay for me that's the biggest reason is why we're just seeing so much suicide and stuff like that because people are becoming so disconnected mm-hmm. we're living in cities of millions but people have never felt lonelier you know what I mean it's crazy and, and I, it's about you know I, I, I worry sometimes that we're heading down this path and you know we're going so fast that when it comes to finding our way back we're not going to remember how to go we had to get there so it was kind of just asking all those questions mm. and, yeah. Yeah, it was a beautiful piece. Is that going to get picked up? And Yeah, well, well LeBois yeah. doing it and we we're talking yeah, with awesome. some other theatre companies about partnering with them, so. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful um, work. Hope we see it up here. Hopefully. Um. <laughs> it means I'll get a trip up here, hopefully. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I love coming up. To, I grew up in Townsville, so I love coming to Darwin. It just reminds me of home, so. Yeah. Mm. And so I was going to lead into that now. You were born in Cloncurry? Yes, but... Murray from the Curry. <laughs> Although they call me slurry from the curry now. <laughs> <laughs> and then you moved to Townsville. Yep. Um, and uh, what I've sort of heard about you is you, um, you're a Michael Jackson fan. Oh, big Michael Jackson fan. And, uh, <laughs> and, and your family used to have parties in Townsville and wake you up to come and dance or was that? Well, it's called, no, it's called curry. curry. Okay. Yeah. So that's when people ask me about performing. Like when did I start performing? And I would say my earliest memory is like five years old and dancing – for the family at barbecues, but you know, they would sometimes I'd, they'd come and wake me up like I'd be asleep, and they're like, Boy, come dance for this mob. And then they'd drag me, and I'd go to my pajamas, I'd be dancing in the backyard, and, <laughs> and that's why I, I kind of loved it because then while all my siblings and cousins that were sleeping, I got to hang out in the back and yeah, yeah. yarn up with all the mobs. So, mm. <laughs> and, and then you moved from there to Perth to study. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was that WAPA? Uh, that Wapper? was the Aboriginal Music Theatre Training Program. So that was like a six-month co- I was only supposed to be in Perth for six months. Yeah. Uh, but then I got into like the Certificate of Music Theatre at Wapper and ended up being there three and a half years. Yeah. Because awesome. like, that was my first plane trip ever from Townsville to Perth. This is a funny story, but the, the flight I took, it went Townsville to Cairns, Cairns to Mount Isa, Mount Isa to Alice Springs, Alice Springs to Ayers Rock, Ayers Rock to Perth. <laughs> now, you think that's funny. On the flight, I had sinusitis. So every time the plane went up and down, like it just felt like a vice was on my head. But because it was the first time I'd flown, I thought it was normal. So I'm like looking around at everyone on the flight and going, how can you people put up with this shit? <laughs> Especially the pilots. Oh, it was horrible, it was horrible. <laughs> and, um, and you're really close to your mum. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. she came to live in Perth as well at, at some point. Oh, you? no, no. Well, she oh, actually she, ended up studying... Oh, uh, yeah, over there as well. And um, she was her and my sister, actually. But mum would come over and do um, units at the uni, so she'd come over for, like, you know, a couple of weeks at the time and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Which was good because that forced me to come out. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to tell that story? That story. Well, <laughs> yeah. So I was kind of living two lives. So I grew up in towns. I left towns when I was 19. And then I went out, started going out on the scene, you know, in Perth and... Um, it's basically living two lives, like, you know, have this out proud kind of lifestyle in Perth and I'd go back home, be in the closet and stuff like that. And then um, 
And then, yeah, then I found out my mother and my sister were coming over. And then I was like, oh, God, and I just pictured me walking down the street with my mother and my sister and then my friends coming up to me going, who was that man you went home with, you slut? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, I better come out. So it was, it was funny and I thought, oh, okay, if I, if I tell mum I'm gay, what am I going to, you know, what am I going to say? And the th I think that kind of happened was I read an article with Melissa Etheridge and she said in this article where she goes, if people aren't there for you afterwards, they were never there for you in the first place. And I thought about my family and I was like, yeah, no, I, you know, I, I knew they, they would be. So I was like, okay, so, you know, how will I say this to mum? So I started writing stuff. And then the next thing I know, it turned into a four-page letter. It said, think about being a writer and a drama queen. Um, <laughs> and I went down to the, um, we had like a mailbox down the uh, end of the street. And so I went down and I posted it and then I went back. But then I'm laying in the bed, I'm thinking, oh, God, what have I done? I'm going to, you know, I started pitching people in the, family fighting over me and those kept me and people not accepting me and I was going to run back down and pour petrol in the mailbox and chuck a match <laughs> in and, and stuff like that but I was like no nah, she's got to know and um there yeah, and then so anyway back in those days because there was no internet back then but it used to take four days for mail to get from Perth to Townsville and so in between like I'd be ringing up mum and just like oh I love you and da 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 and it's funny me and mum we read each other like a book but um she's like what's wrong with you and I'm like what do you mean she goes something's something's bugging you what is it I'm like, oh, I've sent you a letter about it, you know, you'll get it, so, you know, you'll, you'll find out something, okay. So then she rings me um, when she finally got it, she goes, oh, so I got your letter, and I went, oh, and how are you? And she just said, you're my son, I love you, and that was it, yeah. But it was even funny, like, I flew mum down, like, the titter's wedding, um, I thought I'd fly mum down for that, because I thought if marriage equality doesn't go through, or if the impossible happens and I never meet the man of my dreams, um, <laughs> you know, I better fly down so she can at least attend this wedding. But we've got a photo of us two together and she's like beaming in it. And I looked at it and I thought, how she's like really proud of her son being nationally known as a slut. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, yeah, why, why? <laughs> and you can, if you pop onto YouTube and, and uh, Google Titus Wedding Part 4. Yes. Um, that's the actual wedding that they that the two titters did and um, and there's his mum beaming away. It's just yeah, it's <laughs> like if you go to about a minute 30, it's fine. I think she's on the left-hand side, but I'm walking down the aisle singing the wedding song and she's standing she's there like, she's like, <laughs> <laughs> bless her, bless her. That's beautiful. But, yeah, that, but that was the other reason I was um, writing that play as well with mum, you know, because we always talk about the thing with, when we talk about spirits and stuff like that. But... Um, you know, that was the funny thing, the story I was telling you yesterday. But um, I kept dreaming about babies and in my family. When that happens, you know, someone's pregnant. So I ring my sister and I'm like, who's pregnant? And she's like, what? what? No one, why? I'm like, no, I keep dreaming of babies so someone's got to be pregnant. And she goes, oh, well, not that I know of, but if anything happens, I'll let you know. And so anyway, she rings back a couple of weeks later and she's sounding really distraught. She goes, oh, I look like your dreams were right. And I'm like, why, why, who? And she goes, oh, Tanisha. And it was our niece who was only 17 at the time. But our sister, she was keeping it quiet from the rest of the family. Um, so anyway, that, you know, found out, yeah, Tanisha was pregnant. And then I kept dreaming of baby girls. And I'd have it like, she'd be laying on my chest and I'd be holding her and stuff. And, and I rang my niece and I'm like, you're having a baby girl. And she's like, hey, you know. And I'm like, no. I said, uncle keeps dreaming of baby girls, so you're going to have a baby girl. And then mum rings me and she's like, you reckon Tanisha's having a baby girl? I'm like, yeah, well, that's all I keep dreaming of, so it's got to be. She's like, no, nah, well, I keep dreaming of your brother as a baby, so I reckon it's going to be a boy. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm telling you, them dreams are too strong, it's a girl. <laughs> she's like, no, nah, no, nah, well, so am I, and it's a boy. So that um, Tanisha has the ultrasound, and ultrasound says girl, so me ring mum straight away, see, told you girl. And she's like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm still dreaming of your brother, so that bloody ultrasound's wrong, it's a boy. <laughs> and so, um come like you know the birthday and and yeah kira was born baby girl so straight away i ring mom and me just thinking about the competition you know i ring her and i go see told you girl and she goes oh well at least now we know i was dreaming of your brother she was born on my brother's birthday mm. Amazing. <laughs> but it's really funny because i actually worked it into one of the titters thing though too because i rang mum once and like i'll call her like either mother or mother dearest or ros or rosalind but i'll i ring her and hello mother and she goes <gasps> I knew it was you, I just knew it was. <laughs> this, is, this is before caller ID, by the way. Um, it's like, I knew it was you, I just knew it was. And I went to say, ooh, psychic woman, psychic woman. But I accidentally came out with, ooh, psycho woman, psycho woman. <laughs> and she goes, I am, I am. <laughs> I'm like, do you realise what I just said? She's like, yeah, I just fucking picked up on it just then. <laughs> Bless her. So that's in the titters in the in the Facebook official one. Yeah, right. Where it goes, oh, it's like we've got a psych psycho connection. 
Beautiful stuff. Um, so you, uh, you you spoke once about being in Townsville and um, finding it really hard to walk down the street, particularly when black comedy was at its height. Wow, that was crazy. And, yeah. And, yeah. So I've heard yeah. you talk about fame as a double-edged sword. Um, I've heard that you stopped going out in public for that time. I, yeah, I did. I went through a really bad phase, yeah. Yeah. And I've also heard you say, never, ever think you're less than someone, but never, ever think you're more, which I think is really beautiful. Yeah, well, that, that was, you know, my family always taught us that yeah you know and they were always and that was even within our own family you know you yeah. never let anyone else speak down to you like yeah, yeah. yeah you always stand up for yourself but you never ever think you're more important than others as well yeah so you know that's why I think of when I think about equality that's why I was kind of along those lines yeah yeah mm. and so how did you in a small town carve your way through from kind of hiding to actually coming saying no you know I deserve to walk around in a way like how did you navigate that um I was in, in Brisbane uh in Townsville Oh well, oh, well, well at, sorry. What at, have you at, at, oh well, that was when I yeah when I went home and, yeah. and that was crazy. Like oh yeah. yeah, I I couldn't even tell you how many photos were that night, but it was just you know people like running across the road and I felt like Kim Kardashian. It was crazy. Um, so you know at at first it, it kind of you know I, that that was fine. I was I was coping with that, but then it, it got to the point where you know what it was. It was just this constantly like taking of my being. Like, do this perform. Like, you know, I'd go to funerals and people were like, okay, make us laugh. And I'd be like, I'm grieving too. Like, and, you know, people were always like, do this, do that, do that, do that. And it, it was just this constant take, 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 take. And it, I was just got to a point where I felt like I had kind of nothing left to give. But it was, you know, also that thing of like, I realized that it just wasn't going out anymore. So mm. if I'd go out with my friends, I'd never got time to spend with them because I'd have people coming up asking for photos, talking, you know, wanting to know about this, wanting to know about that. And I'd be, you know, trying to catch up with my friends that I hadn't seen in a while and, and stuff like that. So then that's when I realised, well, going out's just not, it's not going out anymore. It's not, I'd be on the dance floor and people would be tapping me on the shoulder like, can we get a photo? I'm like, what, do you think I'm going to finish dancing and run out the door? Like, <laughs> you know, it was crazy. But, um, you know, it was even like, I, I was at the ATM once and a guy's like, he didn't even, he didn't even know my name or, or the black comedy. He just went... Oh my god, do that guy from that show? Okay, can, we, can we get a selfie? And I'm like, yeah, mate. I said, just you know, just let just let me finish here. And, and he's like, yeah, yeah, mate, just get in, just get in. I said, mate, just just let me finish. And he goes, I'm not gonna take your money. And I went, yeah, I know, but just let me finish my shit. I'm not gonna go anywhere, and then we can get the photo. Like, and it was crazy because people were really demanding. Like, I had a girl in Sydney, and I was having you know lunch with my cousin, and she's like, oh my god, can we get a photo? I'm like, yeah, you're right. Else, we got a photo. And um, then after we got the photo, she went, actually, can we make a, can we do a video? And then she goes, I don't what? I don't give a fuck what you think. I'm just going to film us. And then we'll just start, like, filming and stuff. And, and so, yeah, when all of that kind of stuff kind of started happening, like, it was just, yeah, I, I had to navigate myself because it's funny. People say, you know, don't let fame change you, but everybody changes around you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't change with that, you've got, you have to change your way of thinking. And I had to go through that transition of how I perceived things and the way, you know, I would work things out and try to make sense of things because, yeah, it was funny. It was even with, you know, I was uncomfortable. Like, this is going to sound crazy because a lot of people loved it, but I didn't like people giving me things for free. Like, you know, they were, and I'm like, no, I, you know, I, I don't, like, just let me buy for it, let me pay for it. You know, but then I kind of realised is that what these people were actually doing is they, they'd felt I'd given them something. So they wanted to give me yeah. something back. Like, I, yeah, so it was the way I had to, like, think about things for me to, to go through that and, um, yeah, deal with it. Because, yeah, I did. I did. I found, it, I found it really hard. I found I was losing myself. And the thing, the thing is I found myself doing is I was going, oh, I've got to go out and be Stephen Oliver. And I realised that when I was doing that, I was telling myself that it was bad to be Stephen Oliver. You know what I mean? Like, it's like every time I did that, that's when I realised, like, you can't do that. To yourself anymore and, and I had to remind myself who Stephen Oliver was and what Stephen Oliver loved and and it was this you know it was even like simple things to big things so you know I'd write a list one day and I went things good for my spirit and you know I put like family friends laughter or listening to Whitney <laughs> like you know I was those little things like that like dancing to Michael like and I yeah so I had to I had to go through that just to navigate it um otherwise I just found myself like being yeah consumed by it mm -hmm. hmm. Um, so I'm going to ask um, Stephen just one more question then maybe we'll ask him to do some uh, spoken word. Shame to um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll moonwalk, don't you? Oh. 
Um, you know, it's really funny. I was moonwalking around the New South Wales Art Gallery the other day filming something. And I went, I love my work. <laughs> <laughs> no way would I ever get to moonwalk around and like, oh, I was crazy. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> um, so I want to just explore black comedy a bit as, a, as this phenomenon that it is. Um, it's the first ever Aboriginal comedy sketch show. Is that right? Yeah, well, they did do a show called Basically Black back yeah. in the 70s, um, but that was just a pilot that they filmed, yeah. but it was actually based on the um, uh, black theatre company they had down in Redfern and there was a show called Basically Black. Yeah. And they they shot the part of it but they didn't pick it up after that, um, unfortunately. But, yeah, it was the first it was 40, 40 years actually because I think it was 75 and then 2015. Mm-mm. So, yeah. Mm. And and so I want to kind of tease out that thing that we, we were talking about before in terms of um, what the producers of the show put limits on and what they don't. Yeah. And there's a beautiful uh, Wesley Enoch in his Nick Enright speech at the play festival. Ah, yes, yes. Um, mm. He said, deliver your ideas too seriously and your message will be washed away. Deliver your ideas too flippantly and you run the risk of your message being washed away. You have nothing to say and you will be washed away. The pressure to fit a mould not always of your own making, it's a very Goldilocks position, not too much, not too little, but just right. And he refers to a world in which white fellas still program black stories, either written or directed by white fellas, and determines the black narratives the audience is engaged in. And I think you've kind of carved through that for, you know, I sort of look at you, but I don't know what it is behind the scenes. But when I look at your work, the black comedy, mm. um, everyone's working it, obviously, um, th- there's sort of a, such a strong vision through it and there's such a sort of, um, it's almost like it's kind of this train that's bringing all these other people along with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, how is, is it that kind of forceful and kind of active and energised or do you have to sort of battle, battle to get your own... Uh, voice heard still in that context? No, I th- well, I think, you know, whenever I wrote any of the scenes, like, it's funny, it wasn't so much about trusting myself and what I had to say. It was me trusting blackfellow humour. Like, because I've always said blackfellas, like, we are, we're cracked. Like, we are, <laughs> the shit we do, like, seriously. I was telling you last night, like, you know, us blackfellas, like, back home, we have a thing where we call it, you know, you got to go all the way. And what that is, is like, you know, someone spins a yarn, but then you, add something on and then it just gets more ludicrous. So it's like, say, me and my friends, we were driving up Mount Stewart and, you know, it was like, ah, this is high, eh? And then Freddie, he's like, not even. And we're like, ha. And he goes, ah, this high all the time. We're like, ha. And he goes, in a plane. We're like, ha. He goes, then I fly. He's like, ha. And he goes, upside down. We're like, ha. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we just, and, you know, it's just, just that thing of like, you know, and like I said, but the thing is too, as I said, you know, with black followers, We've we've had to learn to laugh at a lot of stuff as well, and you know I was I did a thing with Ben Lee last year, and I, I loved what he said because I realised that's exactly what us blackfellas have had to do, is that he talks about these monks and they say the saying is the logical choice is to be happy, and so that's the thing of sometimes we've had to find the you know and it's a shame that we always get portrayed in this, you know with the media it's kind of this one thing that they're showing people over and over and over again. Uh, were angry or uh, protest that, and it's funny because I find like you know if if we protest something, then we're we're activists or something. But you know when you're on the other shot, then people say they're lobbyists. Like you know, I find I find it always interesting the way words get used in media. Um, you know, but it was even that's and that's why I kind of st- I work in TV, but I don't watch TV anymore. But you know, I realised I was watching um, Sky News once when I was uh, flying to Alice, and this reporter. She was telling this story about, you know, a young girl who died and, like, it was, you know, a tragic story. But as I listened to her tone and as I looked at the words she was using and then when she started talking about things that weren't facts that just had to do with this girl, you know what I mean? Like, I realised that it was manipulating people into a way of feeling and I'm going, why are we having a discussion about free speech in this country when people don't even realise they're having their free thought being taken from them? Well... Mm. Mm. And I forgot what your question was. I think I strayed. <laughs> <laughs> I do that. I go for the tangent sometimes. But, yeah, but it's, it's interesting. And, as, a, as you know, as a writer, I always do that. I look at words and the way words are used and I say, you know, it's why we have youth detention centres and not child prisons. Like that's – so, you know, p- 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 words are very powerful. Mm-hmm. They can create a storm. <laughs> <laughs> See what he did there? <laughs> <laughs> that was a whip to get me off stage. Get off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, and uh, I want to ask um, Stephen to do a spoken word piece, but uh, there's, there's two. I've got I've got subheadings here for today, and one is Stephen the philosopher, because he really that could yeah, be a you, drag you, name, you, Phil. You got philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it! Let's <laughs> uh, see, wordstorm, philosopher, you just come to me. Um, is there's a, there's um, hey, uh, there's a piece in New Matilda that Stephen wrote that you can Google and, and read. It's an extraordinary piece, and um, also big ideas. You're on that, so that's really a, a beautiful listen as well. Um, so out of the out of them, I sort of got Stephen at one point said, "I'm also made of the things you don't see, not just the ones you do." And then the thing that uh, I want to lead into your spoken word piece, people don't get the difference between free speech and hate speech. Yeah. And I think... Well, you know, it's, I find this... This is really interesting. I hate what politicians have done with the term free speech because what free speech actually is, it is the right to speak out against your government without any fear of repercussion. So North Korea doesn't have free speech. China doesn't have free speech. Um, we have free speech in this country. What the politicians have done, they've been very clever and reduced it to name-calling and made us fight amongst ourselves and make it about the other while they're in there giving themselves pay rises and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> so if there's any politicians here who funded this. But, <laughs> but um, you know, it's, it's – yeah, and I find it, it's crazy because I'd, I was asked to speak at the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet in Canberra and it was for Wet Purple Day, which is all about, you know, anti-bullying against, you know, queer youth and stuff like that. And two days before the um, before I was to speak, I got sent an email and um, and it said, "Oh, and by the way, uh, could you not be political?" <laughs> and I'd rang them and I went, "What do you mean, don't be political?" And they're like, "You know, well, oh, well, you know, as the thing, we're apolitical and da you can't go on about that." And 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 um, I'm like, I'm black and gay. <laughs> I, I'm like, have you have you not seen my shit? I write. Like, why did you ask me to speak? Like, um, and I said, look, I, I that's fine. I said, I think I'll pass up on it. You know, thanks. And they're like, oh, you know, don't. We'll go back. And then so anyway, you know, they rang me back and they said, oh, look, it's, it's okay if you can be political in it, but you're just not allowed to criticize the government. And, you know, I was like, oh, okay. So then, and that, you know, that is, that is censorship. And it's interesting that a government that harps on about free speech was telling me what I can and can't say. And then, you know, and if I did, then that was me not getting the job. And that's a repercussion. Mm. So, you know, and, and I, I unfortunately had to say no to a, they were doing a thing with reconciliation. And, and I had to say no to it because the theme is don't let history be a mystery. And, you know, and I said to him, I said, look, the last time you used to come to speak, I ran into this and da, da, da. Is it going to be the same? And I said, oh, yeah, well, you know, it has to da, 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 da. And I said, well, look, I'm sorry, but, yeah, I'm not going to be able to do it because if I was to do it and you talk about that history be a mystery, I would be talking about that stupid $50 million that's being spent on a Cook monument. Yeah. When we've got starving people in this yeah. country, homeless, like $50 million. You know, I worked that out. I said, if that was like... Blackfellas to save up fifty million dollars, like in our eighty thousand years, we'd have to save like six hundred and fifty dollars a year <laughs> to make fifty for eighty thousand years. Six hundred and fifty dollars for eighty thousand years to make fifty million dollars, and this government's just like, you know, it's crazy. Like I just I don't get it. <laughs> um, I, 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 we will come to your spoken word, but are you just everything you said there just also made me think of the incredible courage you have. Um, to forge your own path forward, to believe in yourself, and I'm sure that's been bloody hard, you know, Yakka as well. Um, well to that comes back to my family, I think, they, you know yeah, what I mean? Like they always they instilled that in us, like from a very young age. I remember, do you remember the show Henderson Kids? I remember watching that and I remember, like, you know, there was a thing with some girl, you know, daring the other girl to do something and, like, you know, da da da. You know, and you know, my mother. She looks at us kids, and she's like, you know, I was eleven at the time. She's like, um, you know, if anybody ever tries to do that with you kids, you just tell them to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, like your mum. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <Yes, sir. laughs> so, do you want to give us some some of your? Oh, I'll try. Hey, T yeah. said. I haven't done this it. in a while. Let's hope I. Do it well. Uh, oh, um, if you want to do something stand? else, do it. But I just love it. Up to you. You want to stand? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You. <laughs>
Um, so the reason why, I'll just give you a bit of context, but this uh, poem came about because I put up on Facebook about saying that, you know, as an Australian citizen, I would love to celebrate Australia Day with fellow Australians. And I said, but as an Aboriginal man, you know, there's still stuff that we need to be fixed and, and stuff like that. And um, I couldn't believe the brouhaha it caused. Like, it was all this, yeah, the amount of comments and stuff and, you know, people saying, oh, I, you know, just be thankful the Japanese didn't invade here and all this kind of stuff. And, and the thing that stuck out to me, though, was when um, a guy who had known since primary school, he said to me, let go of the hate. And I was like, wow, you know me since primary school, like, I'm not, I'm not a hateful person. Like, we were taught, you know, my grandfather, Oliver's, they're very big on this, where we say, you, you know, don't say hate. Hate's too strong a word. Say you dislike something or you strongly dislike. Like, we, we, we were taught not to um, say hate. And, um, you know, so even if I find myself saying it sometimes, I always try and correct myself, even now, you know, as a 43-year-old man. Um, but anyway, so that's a bit of context, but it's called Hate He Said. Hate he said, was in my heart. Hate, he said, drove us apart. Hate, he said, to let it go. Hate, he said. But he did not know that what I had inside of me was a sadness born of empathy. That because I did not celebrate, it did not mean I was full of hate. I asked him to destroy and see through my eyes the tragedy of dispossession, of the pain, the hurt, of the red of blood that stains this earth. I mourn for all the lives that were lost. I mourn for what this country cost. I mourn for how we came to be, for the end does not justify the means. It's in the past, he said, move on, why mourn for something so long gone? I looked at him and I came to say, well, do you think we should forget about Anzac Day? It's not the same, was his retort. I said, wait a minute, give it some thought. People died while fighting for their land, protecting it from a foreign hand. Make no mistake, there was a war that had been fought on these very shores. A war that didn't always discriminate, whether elderly or infants could meet the same fate as those who fought to protect them so, and that's why we should never let go. Never forget what price was paid for us to live as we do today. He looked at me quite seriously, said he celebrates because we're free. He celebrates our democracy and everything great in this country. I said, that's fine, I get that, that's clear, just please don't forget how we got here. Just take a moment to think it through what price was paid for me and you to live in this country as we do. Don't take for granted the sacrifice both of land and of life. We need to remember all who died. Not let their memories be swept aside. You got an apology, he said. It talked about loss, it mentioned the dead. What more do you want, he asked of me. And so I replied in the hope he would see. We have a day for Australia, the Queen, for New Year's and Christmas and all those between, like Labour and Easter, the Anzac Parade, and just what the hell is Boxing Day? <laughs> There's even a day that we have for the shows, but nothing that speaks of my people's woes. A national day to acknowledge the cause, to acknowledge all that has happened before, and I don't mean NAIDOC, I mean something more, where the whole nation stops like it does for a horse. A day is that too much to ask to remind us, don't ignore the past. He processed my words and looked at the ground. We both sat in silence. Then there was this sound, a sound that seemed like heaven to me, a sound of two words that said, I agree. We talked some more as the day came to end, and despite our differences, I'd made a new friend. He understood as the day came tonight that I needed some things in this country made right, and because I did not celebrate, it did not mean I was full of hate. Thank you. You're going to make a black fella go red, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I just realised while I was doing that poem and it just kind of when I was talking about a national day and it's actually sorry day today. Yeah, and that's what I mean, like a lot of, yeah, it's not on the kind of radar or anything, like, yeah, but it actually is today. How do we get it on the radar more solidly? I don't know, like, you know, we talk about it, but it's always the thing I talk about, you know, like we need help with people because, you know, black fellas, we always, 
we'll post and stuff. But when you're three percent of the population, it's a bit hard to, you know. And when you're kind of portrayed in a negative light, where people will look at us and go, "Oh, they're going on about it again. Oh, they're whinging again. Oh, they do the when are they going to let it go?" It's kind of a bit hard. So, if you can post about it, that would be nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I really urge you to Google uh, Stephen Oliver, new Matilda, Stephen with a B. Um, but I want to read you a bit. For from virtuous. The... <laughs> <laughs> and very sexy. Oh, yes. <laughs> and very single. And his name's going to – no. Um, uh, it's it's an absolutely beautiful article, but there's one bit in particular which uh, kind of swung me sideways. Um, he says, everything I do, I do it with the hope I can make people feel proud of who they are. See, there are people who fear equality in all its forms because for people to realise equality, they are to realise they're in no way better, that the superior they so long believed themselves to be has always been a lie. Who, would have been, who have been looking down on us for so long that it's too uncomfortable a thought to stand beside another and look into their eyes? They will have to be dragged kicking and screaming from their pedestals, but eventually they'll come to see that we're more alike than we know, that we're more connected than we believe that control of self is more rewarding than control of others. When we dehumanise others, we dehumanise ourselves. And whether lesbian, gay, bi, trans, intersex or straight, we deserve better than that, especially our children. Think about it. A new beginning for all. Um, are you ever going to run for Prime Minister? <laughs> it's like, it's no, like, no. This is the Australia that oh. I want. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I look at it. I look at politics. It's about... <laughs> I think, you know, the, and this is when I talk about, you know, with, with systems and stuff and what we're doing to ourselves, you know, I'm sure a lot of people go into politics with the good intentions, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and people do, you know, maybe sometimes change the world, but I think it's a kind of a system that's, there's so much manipulation and deceit and backstabbing and, and kind of stuff in there. Like, I, I don't, you know what I mean? You would, to, to make, to be prime minister, what would you have to do to get to that position? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. Compromises. Well, yeah, it is. It's, yeah, I don't even know if it's compromised. I like, you know, it's like even, because I, I look at them and I think you, you people have no right to talk about bullying. The way you carry on in question time and the way you speak about each other. And then you're going to stand there and say, oh, it's how the way kids bully, bully, and bully, and just need to stop bullying. And like, well, how about you set an example? Lead by example. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, and do you, um, I mean, I feel like your life, your, your work changes lives every day. Um, I mean, just sitting out there with you, a few people came up and said, you know, you've, you've, you know, you've given me this, you've changed that for me. Um, I know people bring their children up to meet you and, and you know, you've been a role model for them. Um, what, what sort of in terms of your, what's coming up for you, what's, what's your next kind of creative project to you? I've got a few things happening. I've got a web series. Um, I label it just so it's actually going to be a first, but I label it as the first ever Aboriginal love story online musical. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, that'll be coming out soon. That We've had some good news around that, but um, that, that's been really interesting to see the reaction we've had so far from people within the industry. So I'm, I'm excited to release that um and then of course got the play in that happening as well and yeah. um and more tv yeah. stuff um, um I, I don't know about it i think i think maybe film i would like to do film i would like to write a feature yeah next awesome. like i really i really want to set one in my hometown Cloncurry. i have this thing about putting Cloncurry on the map you know it's kind of big. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's gonna know about Cloncurry. <laughs> um so yeah but um yeah no, just, i just write out because i find myself you know it's it's interesting where um, when I look at other actors act out my stuff, I'm, I'm more proud of that, if that makes sense. Um, like Shari, because we've got Shari Seven's Darwin Girl. Oh, I've chucked Darwin in there in the web series as well. <laughs> I call her a downtrodden, destitute, doogie Darwin diva. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, and, and, and it's going to be in a light that no one's ever seen Shari in before. Um, she's cracked. Like, okay, I'll give you a give one thing away but she gets up on st oh, I don't know if I should should I leave the surprise you just want to be surprised no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay well she um her opening song um she's doing as a tribute to Whitney Houston um but it's also um uh, to send a message to all the one of you who try and sing Whitney's signature songs and it's called all you gammon bitches better fuck along <laughs> 
Sai Shari serve this again. Oh, you little gammon bitch, it's better fuck along. <laughs> <laughs> but when she was recording it, um, you know, we like, like me and Tracy, the director, we went in there to like give her directions. But black fellas, we couldn't help ourselves. Like I couldn't look at her. I was sitting like this. <laughs> and like Tracy had the script. Can I buy that piece of paper? The director is like this. And Shari, she had her eyes closed the whole time because she couldn't look at us. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to see that. Um, so we, we might um, uh, have some audience questions and I, I would like to, to end after the questions with another piece, if you have it in you, but entirely up to you. But, yeah. you know, go. So oh, um, let, let's have maybe ten minutes questions. Oh, this one. So um, we haven't heard about your Are You OK work. It'd yep. be interesting to hear what you're doing there. Um, yeah, so th they messaged me a couple of years ago now and um, I asked if I would be interested in being an ambassador. And I started thinking about um, my relationship with suicide um, as, a, as a gay Aboriginal man because I belong to two of the highest suicide rates um, in, the, in the country. And... When I thought about it, my first contact with suicide was an uncle of mine who'd shot himself when I was 10 years old. Um, and then I started thinking of all the cousins and friends and that I'd lost, you know, throughout the, uh, the year. And, you know, sadly it's a thing that seems to be happening more. You know, it's not happening less. And, like, you know, I say about whenever I talk with, you know, with Mob, I say, you know, at one point, you know, this continent we were 100% Blackfellas, and I said, we're only 3% now. And when we're losing ourselves to chronic illnesses, you know, when our life expectancies are, you know, 10 to 15 years shorter, um, you know, and substance abuse and, you know, and then suicide's happening, it's like we, we, can't, we can't afford that. Like we literally cannot be afforded to, to have mob taking their lives. So, you know, usually I'll go around and I'll just speak with mob and, and have a yarn and, and we'll talk about it. And I'll be very open, you know, with my stuff too, because when I went through the whole fame thing, I went through a very dark period. And, you know, there was times when it was just like I always had noise in my head. And I would actually picture myself falling off the story bridge in Brisbane with the wind blowing past my ears, just to try and have calm. And then, and then I would just go to black, like that was the kind of stuff I was having. But, you know, I was saying to people, you know, there's a, there's a stigma around it too, but it's like it's not it's not shame to feel those things, it's not weakness to express that. Like we all like you know, and, that, and that's what I always talk about with our connection as as people. You know, it's we we have more in common than we know. Like our humanity. That is the you know. I often have a thing about because I'm a big science fiction freak, um, but you know, when people talk about parallel worlds. And I said, well, you know, when you think about it, this world, this one earth that we are on, there's, constant, there's currently seven billion parallel worlds at the moment because this experience that I'm having will not be the same experience to you. Do you know what I mean? Like we, we all will view it in a different way. We all have our own worlds. But it's our threads of humanity that will connect us and, it, you know, we find that common ground. So, um, you know, I just try to talk to people about those things and, you know, and don't be ashamed and... and or if you think someone's going through something, then talk to them. And, and it's okay to not have answers. You know, no one expects you to be an expert. Um, but, you know, sometimes if you're an ear, like, you know, I said, not only do we stand on shoulders, but we lean on them as well. And, and if, you, if you know someone is going through that, then maybe you can help them go to see someone who can help them with that. So, you know, it's, it's just kind of just trying to spread that message and, and, and not to feel alone because... That's, that's the saddest thing, I think, is when just we feel alone when we don't need to be. Thank you. Oh, um, no. Are there any other uh, questions from right. the audience? So being part of a minority, there's a lot of disadvantage that comes with that, but I find that there's also a lot of um, joy that comes from it as well and connection and things. Um, can you speak to your experience being in a few minorities um, what your experience of the joys in those are? Well, you know, it was funny, like, when I... Um, it was that thing about me saying, when you know, trusting the black fellow humour, and the thing I think about being a minority is that you have the opportunity to show something that a lot of people haven't seen. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I mean about when we get portrayed in this one kind of view all the time. Um, 
that was the thing with me with black comedy what I was able to that was part of the joy of it was being able to share that and I would love it when I would see on um, people's comments when they would write you know under the videos but they would go what the fuck did I just watch <laughs> because to me that meant they'd never seen something like that before do you know what I mean like I looked at it in that way so for me that you know that's 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 one of the joys that I that I you know that I love <laughs> and yeah, thankfully people you know love it back. But what's <laughs> what's really funny? I remember when I wrote the first titters scene. Um, it was the can't even dance. That was the very original one. The bus stop. The bus stop <laughs> one. But I looked. I looked at the producers and I went, "Is tasting my hole too much?" <laughs> <laughs> and I went, "No, leave it in." I went, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Mm. Um, well, then no more. Questions you might ask. Oh, yep. It's not. It's not so much a question, Stephen, but a thank you. Um, I shared with you earlier that my sister's a little girl from Warrington Island, and when we were growing up, she had very few role models. And I know they're out there, but very few of them are so public and so pr pr proud of what they do and so confident. So I just want to like say thank you because you're one of the few people that make a real difference. Ah, uh, thank you. So it's funny though, it's like I, I get uncomfortable when turns like when people call me a role model and I make a joke out of things, I'm like, yeah, more like a mole model. Yeah. <laughs> it's like when people, you know, say, oh, you're my idol. I'm like, you've got to raise your standards. <laughs> <laughs> you're awesome. Um, are you happy for another question? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah beautiful. Okay. I'm about to inject some blackness into this here affair. Now, to be exact, when I say black, it's my aboriginality I want to declare. See, we're 3% of the population, so to see this shit is rare, so sit back, relax, and embrace what I've got to. Because I've got nothing but love to share. <laughs> okay, I lied, I might share some facts. Uh, facts that pertain to us minority of blacks, like we're 3% of the population, but we're 27% of the jails. My own family are statistics when it comes to Aboriginal males. Our life expectancy is shorter by around 10 or 15 years. That's why in a space of six months, Five times I shed tears. See, we're numbing our lives with substance abuse. And if that doesn't work, we look for a noose. Our suicide rates are among the highest on earth. And people think the answer is to deny us our worth. We should just forget who we are. Act the right way. Because this is the right way. If you want a better life, you better do what the man say. And it just goes around in circles. 229 years and we're facing the same hurdles. Asking for the same things we've been asking since way back when, like, let us be ourselves on our own lands. And this isn't about guilt. It's not about blame. It's not about trying to make people feel shame. Because, see, we'll say it's the white man. Then he says it's us blacks. And we go back and forth till we're talking to backs or we're sitting in silence, not saying a word, or maybe we're screaming. But not being heard. The truth of it is, we're in this together. So why not be brothers and sisters and work for the better? Why not start talking, lending our ears, embracing the truths and facing the fears? We all share this land every day, every night. So why not look to the plight and help make things right? Because only when people are truly equal, you see, is when we can say we're all free. <laughs> um, Stephen Oliver, this has been one of the great privileges of my life to have oh, you. You've got to raise your standards here. too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, thank you, guys. Very much appreciated. Extraordinary man. <laughs> <laughs>